This episode is brought to you by BeWaterSmart.info. Is your yard summer strong? A summer strong yard is tough enough to take the heat and still look its best. Here's two ways to help. First, replace your thirsty lawn with native and low water use plants and install drip irrigation and high efficiency rotor sprinklers. You'll use less water and have a healthier, happier yard. Second, here's how to help your trees grow strong enough to handle the summer heat. First, check the soil with a moisture meter or screwdriver to see if it's dry. If you need a water, set up a soaker hose or drip irrigation at the outer edges of the tree's branches. Water your trees at least once a month. Find more helpful tips and videos at BeWaterSmart.info. Look at that plant. I want you to know that everything was grown in my garden. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Flower Power Garden Hour. I'm your host, Marlene, and this is your July to do list. So, we are in the swing of summer, and for many, that means heat. And yes, we've been having a very mild summer. We've had one weekend, I think we made it all the way through June. The last day of June finally hit 100 degrees, which is very rare. And then we were blessed with a weekend with 108 degree and this coming weekend is going to be 109. But three days ago, it was 83, which is also incredibly unheard of as well. So of course, on the weekends, the 109 degree temperature is coming. Are you ready for it, Joe? Oh, I'm ready and excited. Yeah, because when it was 108 at five o'clock in the afternoon, you said, I'm going for a run. And I looked at you and said, you're insane. Text me when you get back to the car. I also send a search party out. You'll be dead on the side of the trail. Yeah, uh, it's great. My argument mm-hmm. has always been for this. For what? Being dead on the side of the trail? <laughs> if you got to go, you got to go. All right. Okay. Okay. Heat is fantastic. You know why heat's fantastic? No. Because it's an absolute bonus that you get from a cardio aerobic perspective when you're exercising. If it's hot out, when yeah. it was like 105 or hotter, uh-huh. your heart rate goes way up because you have to evacuate heat. So yeah. all of a sudden, your heart rate goes up, more blood goes out to the extremities mm-hmm. to you know evacuate heat mm-hmm. and such. Your heart rate artificially goes up by like 10 to 15% yeah. for the same amount of effort. Okay. This is a huge bonus. So when I'm running, yeah. right, and I was trying to keep about 150 to 160 beats, okay. I was up like 15% above that. Okay. So I I will say that years ago when I was training for long distance triathlon, you know, my days of training were very long and what I would do is start in the morning. So I might go for a bike ride in the morning and my core temperature would increase with the day. So by the time I had to get off the bike and go say run and it was a hundred degrees, 105, I didn't notice it because my body temperature was rising with the heat. To me, that's different than being in air condition or inside or in the shade and then all of a sudden stepping outside when it's 108 degrees. To me, that's difficult. And you also realize, Joe, how much do I sweat? Sweating's got nothing to do with it. What do you mean? I sweat a lot. Okay. And? Yeah. And I'm the only person I know who gets hot goosebumps. No, so I, get, I think no, I, no, 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 no. I have you a, are not the only person that gets that. I think I am. No, I get that. Hot goosebumps? Of course. I didn't know you got who no one I know else gets hot hot goosebumps. Well yeah. No. Now you're just trying to does. copy copy me. Okay, it's my thing. You just anyways, don't like the idea any, of it. Anyways, starting with more cool and act you know, going through the day with it, that's different than jumping outside. Anyways. So um can we talk about what else is going on besides your craziness? Big thing at work, speaking of heat, this is a big problem at work, is our DI water is out. That's deionized water. Ideally, we would have reverse osmosis RO water. We have deionized water. Labs use it. means stripped of everything. So that's why when we fertilize, we put everything back. Apparently, there's a major leak breakage at the central plant on campus. And we had no water at the – no DI water at the conservatory. In, in different buildings as well, where they got the other buildings going. But we have not had DI water on demand at the conservatory. Then they managed to get it where we have to call every morning and have them turn it on. And then we quickly drain the tank. 
And this has been going on for weeks now. And the problem with that is we've been watering with industrial water. And being there 15 years, we've never just watered with industrial water. So we've had to do that or we turn the DI water on and water the carnivorous plants. We've had no misters. We've had no misters and no humidifiers in the conservatory. So I'm waiting for the plants to all of a sudden just go, we've been looking good. We've tolerated it. And now we're just going to hit a wall. So I'm waiting every day to walk in and just having that switch where they just look like crap. But I'm hoping they get the DI on soon. Apparently they had to dig up tons of cement to get the, um, but still it's a big problem. And it's like, okay, why don't we have our own reverse osmosis system? Um, so that's just been something we've been dealing with at work. But other than that, um, went backpacking up on the Sierras. Oh man, there's still a lot of snow. A lot of snow, a lot you of water. You showed me a video the other day about these, uh, two guys that were doing the, the Codgers. Pacific... The what? They're called the Codgers. Okay. They're doing the Pacific Crest Trail. Yes. Yes. And I asked you when it was from, and you said like yesterday. Yeah. Yeah. And there was a lot of snow. A lot of snow. A lot of snow. A lot of snow. A lot of water. A lot of water on the trail. A lot of snow on the trail. A lot of very scary water crossings. That's almost worse than the snow is the water crossings as it melts. So be safe out there. But I mean, we need that water. But, um, but yeah, that's. I liked your message. Be, be safe, safe out, out there. there. Be safe out there. Yeah. Be safe inside and be safe out there. About that. Or don't and go run when it's 110. There you go. Live a little. There, live a little. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So July. So because it's so hot, you know, it's obviously not a good time to plant. I, you know, I push it through June, July. Don't even. It's, you know, it's, you put a plant in the ground. It's struggling to get water. The root systems aren't established. Uh, just don't do it. Just just wait until it cools down. Um, so really, there's not anything I would recommend planting, even vegetables. The only thing is, is believe it or not, if you like to start your Brussels sprouts, cauliflower, and broccoli by seed, now is the time to sow the seeds inside because you do plant that winter crop as early as August, which is insane because it is a winter crop, but the first round could be planted then. So don't direct sow them. Sow them in well, – yep, Joe, go ahead. So it's a winter crop. It's a winter crop, fall crop. Winter slash fall crop. Yes. Okay. Now – is that a uh, our our winters and falls have been highly variable in terms of when you know it starts to get cold when mm -hmm. it starts to get wet? Yes. Now I know you can't foresee that and plan it uh, out, but does the success rate of those seeds that you're starting to sow now, if you're going to start planting them in August, is it highly variable and dependent depending on how warm slash cool slash wet slash dry the fall and winter is? No, it's more day length is what gets these plants God. going. All right. You're okay. assuming if you're planting them in August, like I said, sow them inside, keep the soil moist, right? Mm -hmm. You sow, put it, planting them out in August, September, you know it's going to be hot and dry. It's We haven't had that much variable. But um, yeah, I mean, the wetter, the, the winter, I always find that rains do a better job of watering in your garden more than irrigation, no matter what. Um, so if we have rain in the fall, yeah, that's just. Sure. But the overlying issue is the length of day. The length of day. Yeah. Day length. Um, okay. So with that said, really don't plant anything. What you do want to focus on is of course watering and that goes for trees, especially newly planted trees. If you have a tree that's three years or less, definitely a year, you know, you have the little berm that you've planted around it and you could fill that up once, let it soak down, fill it up again let it soak down. And if it's a fairly recently planted tree, you could do that twice a month. An established tree, it's not a bad idea to deep water that tree once a month. Now, remember if the roots are going, you know, if it's an established tree, its roots are out and about. Your neighbor has a lawn and it's, those roots are underneath there. They're getting that lawn water. You have irrigation around. So, you know, it's never necessary. You see these trees and you're like, how is it getting water? Well, those roots are getting water various places, but it's never a bad idea to just, you know, deep water a tree. And what you could do if you don't have an irrigation ring set up, just put a hose underneath it, turn on a little dribble and water it 
I used to water them, you know, just like a couple hours, move the hose around to different spots. Um, you know, you could always just take a big, long screwdriver and jab it into the soil 18 inches and see how moist it is. Especially redwood trees. Redwood trees, their roots are way more shallow and most trees need infrequent deep watering. Redwood trees, they rely on the fog drip. That's why in the Central Valley and other places they look like crap because we don't have the, the coastal fog. They need more frequent watering. Their, their roots are more shallow. So that's the exception to the trees. And so just don't forget about the trees. I'm not saying, you know, these mature trees with landscaping around where there's irrigation need to be watered, but definitely younger trees do need to be that deep, deep water to get the roots to go down. And of course, your irrigation should be set on deep watering. Someone sent me a question where they're watering their uh, bird of paradise twice a day for 10 minutes. Mm -mm. Don't do that. That's, you know, that's not the way you want to water. You want to maybe water it that twice a week at 30 minutes. Um, Bird of paradise, you probably get away with watering once a week for, you know, 30 minutes deep watering. Um, so yeah, so just, you know, always dig down into the soil, see where the moisture is at, but deeper infrequent. And of course, I can't stress enough is mulch. Mulch is going to keep that moisture in there. It's going to smother the weeds. It's going to prevent that heat from just baking your soil, those roots up at the surface. So there's still time to mulch. If you haven't laid compost down or mulch, do so. Um, harvesting. Of course, your tomatoes are probably coming in right about now. Great year for tomatoes because we had a cool spring. Everything's setting with the heat. Yeah, you may, you know, may stall a little bit of fruit set, but um, great year for tomatoes. And they're pretty standard when you harvest. But, you know, if your melons are coming in, you know, watermelons always look at that first tendril. The first tendril by the watermelons should be dry. Bottom spot, it's going to have that yellow. Cantaloupes are a pain in the butt because by the time they're ripe, they should just fall off. But a lot of times they could crack. So if you don't get them right away. Um, yeah, peppers are coming in. So just remember harvest. Your zucchinis could get, you know, bigger than the Empire State's building overnight. It's already happened. So remember to snip off flowers of certain things like basil if you want them to last longer, your annual flowers. Yeah, snip the flowers off, deadhead them. Um, else all the energy is going to go into seed. So that's going to prevent, um, you know, shorter, shorter length of blooms if you feel like it. I keep an eye out for bugs. Hasn't been a very buggy year, which is good, but I know they're going to be there. I've been getting questions about uh, squash bugs, first, first uh, leaf footer bug which um, is a big pain because they will go after your tomatoes. And really for the squash buds and leaf footed bees, there's not, it's not like you could spray them. What you want to do is hand pick them and squish them. You know, there's no sprays that are going to magically work. It's just physically removing them. If there's a lot of them, just hose blast them. And really the key for all this is just cleaning up after the, after the, um, the season and just having a well-balanced garden. Don't use any of the harsh chemicals. And hopefully you'll bring some predators. Birds are going to be your best predators for big bugs like that. So, you know, plant sunflowers around that are going to produce seeds that are going to get the birds to come in. And they're going to, hey, look at those bugs. I'm going to go get them. If you have cucumber beetles, remember, add nematodes in the off season. Um, they're going to get some of the, the underground larvae. And yeah, so, you know, white flies are always a pain in the butt. It's the hardest one to control because... It's, there's no magic answer. You hit them with the hose, the adults fly off. People think, oh, the traps aren't working, but they really are. They just cycle through so much. So preemptively hit the leaves, rinse the leaves off. Um, I've had all these peel bugs on my cantaloupes. I went to go look at my cantaloupes and they're all puckered and a whole bunch of peel bugs all the way around. And luckily I had some iron um, uh, sluggo plus. So, you know, slug goes iron phosphate for snails and slugs. I don't have a problem with snails and slugs because the turkeys take care of all the slugs for us. But the uh, the plus part is the spinosad, which is for all the creepy crawlers. And, you know, spinosad, you've heard me mention before, is even though it's organic, it's not safe for bees. But in a pellet form on the ground, the bees aren't going there. So the sow bugs, peel bugs, earwigs are going to eat that. Alternative, you could use diatomaceous earth. It's a fine powder. Problem with that. Same thing. If you get it on the flowers, any beneficials, any pollinators going to it, you, you want to avoid that. But 
it breaks down faster when it gets wet. The iron phosphate pellets will stay a little bit longer. So I like I like the pellets. So um, that's my big pest right now is the peel bugs getting to my my cantaloupe. I don't know if I've ever told my peel bug story. Um, I don't know. I don't have the memory for it. Go yeah, ahead. I might have to tell it now. Go ahead. Yeah. So this is when I was like three or four. I was sitting outside. I remember where I was at. There was a low spot in the in the uh, cement area with a tiny little bit of water. And this is down San Diego, right by the beach where we lived, which I thought everyone lived. And my mom said she looked out the window once, saw me. This is when you could let your three and four year old just play outside in visual eyesight, but still outside on their own. Next thing she knows, she looks out and I'm running towards her, holding my head, screaming. She thought, oh, my God, what happened? She hurt her head. There's no blood. She's like, oh, my God, she's having a brain aneurysm. I'm screaming and flailing and flailing. So she calls the ambulance. Um, I vaguely remember this. Um, no, what happened was I was there and I saw a peel bug, roly poly. And uh, what flashed through my mind was the cartoons where the cartoon characters would take a pillowcase and put it between their ears and floss between their their ears. And it, within a split second, um, impulsive me went, huh, I wonder what would happen if I put this peel bug in my ear if it would roll out the other side. Well, no. Put it, as soon as I put it in my ear, I knew that was a mistake because it rolled up, rolled, hit my eardrum. And having a bug crawl around at the base of your eardrum is not pleasant. So I was screaming. Of course, I didn't vocalize this to my mom. So she's thinking I'm having a brain aneurysm. So the paramedics come. I don't think they could figure out what's happening to me. I'm flailing like crazy. So I go to the hospital, flailing like crazy. Um, the story is they had, my mom said they had to call random people from the hallway to hold me down, to give me a shot, to knock me out. I think by then they figured out I had something in my ear. So they knocked me out and they flushed out my ear and they gave me the roly poly and I got to take it home. Um, but for years I told everyone that it crawled up into my ear because even though I was three or four, I was not dumb enough to admit I put it in my ear. And it might've only been X number of years ago that I confessed, but it was pretty funny because this one gal who, um, lived in our neighborhood when I was three or four, found me on Facebook. And the first thing she wrote to me on Facebook Messenger is, didn't a roly poly climb up into your ear? And I'm like, God, I still have to set the record straight all these years later. So yeah, that's my roly poly story. So I have a love-hate relationship with them. That's it. That is my roly poly story. So I had to now just cheat them with iron phosphate. Yep, that's all. There you go. And that's my story. I had to share uh-huh. one of maybe maybe your maybe your most shining moment in life story. That wasn't uh, it? No. With um somebody I work with today. What's my most shining moment? And I know you mean that Well, you definitely were not shining when it happened. Oh the shit story. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. So, okay. When we were having a house built, we lived in a 40 foot trailer. We didn't have it hooked to septic. We had to have the septic, the holding tank pumped, but to go between having it pumped, we got a secondary tank, but I'd have to go under the trailer, hook a hose to the waste tank and then transfer it to the secondary tank. The hose came undone and got all over me. Not just once. Twice. You shouldn't admit the twice thing, frankly. Yeah. 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 Twice. Yeah. And the second time I think I, well, first time I probably called you, the second time I called you just covered in literal shit. Yeah. Crying. Yeah. Going, I can't do this anymore. And what did I say? I think the first time. It's all yours because you didn't use it. You waited to go to work. I believe I also said, well, I guess we have to get divorced. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I don't even remember. It was too painful. Yeah, it was bad. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah so that but was. Yeah. Who was the bright point out of all of this? I could tolerate a lot in life. No, no, no. Who? Who was the shining point in this? Yeah. Associated with, you know, the entire trailer shit. Kip? Kip. Kip. Kip the shitter man. Kip the shitter man. Yep. Yeah. 
I mean, who else walks down the street and their shitter man waves high and honks and you wave back at him? Hi, Kip, shitter man. That's right. Yeah, he used to come pump her shit out. cut ass, cut cut off sleeves. Yeah. Yep. winter time, summertime. Didn't matter. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Yeah, it was Kip. And Kip had no fear of that black tank. No, no fear at all. Zero. No, no fear. Yeah. We need more Kips in this world. All right, so that's your July to-do list. So just, um, you know, it's maintaining, harvesting, watering. Um, so let's get to some questions, Joe. Okay. Question number one. What is a, you know, I like it when you put the name of the person. Oh, there's the name of the person. Well, there you go. There you go. This is Mark. Okay. With a C. Okay. What is a good way to get rid of ants in the house? By the way, we also have dogs in the house mm. that we are not looking to get rid of. Oh, did they put that? No. We have cats. Some of them we're looking to get rid of. A few. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, so really, it, it sounds like it's not going to your plant. So it sounds like now I'm just like a, a bug person, right? So this is my go-to. This is my go-to. Now, whether – it's not – I don't think this is super safe for dogs and kids. I don't know how your dogs are. There's obviously more poisonous things than this. So obviously I'm not saying this is not completely safe to use around. But this is what I use. This sounds like a horrible answer right off the bat. I, well, I'm just being honest. So our last house literally was built on an ant hill. We had so many ants we in did. that last house. It was insane. So I'd buy those tarot ant baits. It would go through them so much. And at work, we have to put ant bait out because ants, and I've heard me mention this before, they farm all the the sucking pests. So you want to get rid of them to allow in the natural predators. Same thing at work. We're going through these tarot ant baits. And, you know, they cost a lot of money. So you can make your own. Um, your mom's the one who told me about this, actually. So you get the borax, um, usually in the bottom shelf. And you take half a cup of sugar, one and a half tablespoons of borax, one and a half cups of warm water, and you mix it all together and you create a syrup. So it should be more of a syrup. If it's too watery, add a little bit more sugar to make it syrupy. And then you could just soak cotton balls in it or pour a little bit into bottle caps and then place those around. So it's the same thing as the tarot ant baits, much cheaper to make. You have a lot of it, just store it in the fridge, label it so someone doesn't think it's like sugar or honey. And um, so you could use that. And you could put those where dogs won't get. So if you know, you put them up high where the dogs aren't going to get the cotton balls and stuff. So that's what I, that's what I would use. Um, obviously, if you find spots, you could silicone and seal them, but they could find their ways in every, everywhere. But I think that's the safest bet. I think diatomaceous earth works, but like I said, it breaks down and it's, you sort of, this is where they will come and take it back to their their nest, whereas diatomaceous earth, they have to climb over it. So if they start going around it, it's not going to do the job. So that's my go-to. Mark, I'm a little sketched out by leaving it out around the dogs. Well, then. I wouldn't leave it around the dogs. That's what I'm saying. Double check. Put it away far from the dogs. This is from No Name. My pumpkins are turning yellow and rotting before they turn orange. Okay. This is like an old October or early Halloween. It's either early or late. Might be right in the middle. What? Who's asking about pumpkins right now? Pumpkins are starting to set. They could start set. Yeah. 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 Um, I don't have any giant pumpkins forming this year. Last year I had that one pop up and just form a giant pumpkin. None this year. Bummer. I didn't plant any pumpkins. I mean, they're useless. They really are. Last year that giant thing rotted. I mean, I didn't plant it and just formed a giant pumpkin. Um, okay, so probably it didn't tell me the size, but I'm guessing it's not that large. One, we're early in the season, and two, what I think is happening is it's probably not being pollinated. So, uh, you know, the the fruit you've heard me mention is the ovary, and so it already looks like there's a mini pumpkin or a mini fruit on a lot of these curcurbits like zucchini and squash. Even before the flowers open, you could see a miniature little cucumber, miniature squash, a miniature pumpkin. So it's the ovaries there. Now, if it opens up and it gets pollinated a tiny bit, it might start swelling. But a lot of these fruits have to be pollinated by a lot of pollen, completely pollinated. So they have to be visited by a lot of bees or pollinators. So if it's just partially pollinated, it may swell a little bit and then uh, not fully pollinated and then it'll rot out. 
something else that might be happening is if it is one of these pumpkins that is a large variety, it may set a few fruits, but because a lot of energy is going to one particular one, it will abort the other fruit. And that's very common as a fruit tree will thin itself. If it can't hold on and maintain all of its fruit, it will drop it. A large species pumpkin will do that as well. It doesn't even have to be a large one. It just means, you know, if you have a pumpkin that's, you know, foot across, that's pretty big. So it may abort the other fruit, but I have a feeling it's probably just not being pollinated fully. And like with every cucurbit, you can hand pollinate them in the morning time when the flowers open, find a male, take the pollen, Q-tip, flux brush, uh, paintbrush, and move it to the female if you really want that particular one um, pollinated. So I think that is that is what's happening with your pumpkins. And it, people have been asking me, like, why are my cucumbers not forming? And that's the same reason is um, probably not being fully pollinated yet. And it could be even that, you know, you, you had the female flowers first. Usually you get male flowers on cucurbits first. Every once in a while, you can only have female flowers, so there may not even be the male flowers there to pollinate it. You done? I'm done. Okay. Yeah, okay. All right. I wasn't sure. Okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's from Ashley. Is this the Ashley that you work with? Oh, Ashley and Good Day Sack? (coughs) Good Day Sack, Ashley. I don't think so. Her mom's the one who asked me all the questions. No, I didn't know she asked questions. Yeah, her mom does, Hmm. yeah. What are the fastest growing shrubs that do well in full sun and minimal water? Okay. Um, So are you okay over there? So they didn't say size shrubs. So a lot of people use the term shrub, you know, very loosely. A shrub could be two feet tall. It could be 10 feet tall. So um, it's a little hard. So I'm, I'm assuming we're talking like a larger shrub, maybe five, six feet tall. So, um, these are my go-tos. So fast growing is also, you know, relative. But um, a toyon, a native, California native toyon, heteromelis, is a great shrub, full sun, minimal water, doesn't even need summer irrigation. I mean, of course, summer irrigation is going to make it grow faster no matter what, but it doesn't necessarily need it. It's a good evergreen tree. There's yellow fruiting ones, more rare, and then there's the red fruiting ones. And, you know, they get up to 12, 15 feet tall. You could prune them down. They're just great, great shrubs. Photinia is sort of just the standard. You see them sheared into a hedge, but if you let them go, they have beautiful flowers, nice red foliage. They do take full sun, um, but you could also shear it into a hedge. Pretty fast growing. Does get like that Photinia leaf spot if they're planted too closely. So do give a little bit of space to them. But I hate when people shear them too much because they do have beautiful flowers and nice red foliage. Ceanothus. Ceanothus can be incredibly fast growing. And if you grow the shrub ones, they can grow five, six feet tall. Now, you've heard me mention with ceanothus is they may grow really fast. The problem is if they're not in perfect drainage, they're in clay soils, they live about seven, 11 years, and then they're just so stressed over time in clay soils, winter rains that they could literally die overnight on you. So I hesitate to put that. But if you have great drainage, really fast growing. Euonymus is another no fuss shrub. This thing doesn't care. The one we have, I didn't plant it, has had like powdery mildew for like seven years as long as we've lived here and it doesn't care. Um, but it's another, you can get a variegated euonymus and it gives a little bit of gold, gold um, accent. Um, this is a shorter one and a little bit different of a shrub. A few years ago, well, more than a few years ago, it was sort of like the it plant, Breath of Heaven, Coleonema. It's that sort of the wispier shrub. A lot of people plant them thinking, oh, it's going to stay nice and tidy, but they could get like five feet wide, five feet tall, but it's uh, more of a wispy shrub. Some things that people don't think about is um, a rose as a shrub. There's, you know, the simplicity roses, but the Rosa mutabilis, which is the China rose, is really a great big, big shrub. And it's a rose that stays evergreen for the most part, blooms for a long time, and you don't have to prune it like a rose. Trust me, you don't want to prune this thing because it's massive. It could get eight feet wide, eight feet tall. Single single shrub or a hedge, really pretty. And, of course, oleander. I mean, how can you be oleander? Needs absolutely no water, fast growing, beautiful flowers. Yes, it's poisonous. Um, Tucrium. 
but the two cream that fruticans the blue flowering one low water and a texas ranger shrub called leucophyllum it has purple flowers low water full sun and so those are some of the shrubs that i would just recommend that are fairly fast growing full sun and minimal water and pretty much not too fussy some of those you know do have a little bit of um problems but hey who doesn't right all right are we on the final question final question of the night of the night i don't know the context for when this one is okay but i think it does matter okay i believe you did a segment on good day Uh uh-huh about cut flowers yes okay well lola is asking i missed your segment on good day sacramento what are the best cut flowers all right because yes my last one on good day sacramento was cut flowers um okay so these are my favorite cut flowers there are so many more um but these are the ones i like to grow and i have great success with and are very very easy to grow and you could start these all by seeds in trays in springtime you could direct sow some of them in the ground and if you could find starts at nurseries go ahead so some of them are harder to find starts um Beetle goat's trying to come in. Or that's Ava. That's Ava. Ava wants to come in. Um, So I'm going to start with Cosmos. Cosmos looks nice and airy and it looks fragile, but actually is a really good cut flower. And there's various different Cosmos. Um, I personally like the double petaled ones. I think they just add a little more pizzazz. But for a cut flower bouquet, they have a lot of airiness. But yeah, they're not as... as, uh, fragile as they look. And I hate the little dwarf ones. So get the ones that are going to be, you know, the taller variety ones, because then you have longer stems. Zinnias, it's hard to beat zinnias. They bloom all summer long. They come in pretty darn vibrant colors. There are some other ones that are multicolored. You can find, um, you know, a lot of these nurseries aren't going to carry the specialty ones. You have to find them like uh, Johnny Seeds, uh, Baker Creek, um, Renee's Garden Seeds, just a lot of the seed catalogs will have the burpees even will have a lot of the different varieties that are more fun than just what your nurseries are going to have. Sunflowers, of course, you know, the giant ones, of course, aren't the, the best ones for cut flowers because they're huge. Um, but try a variety of them. This flower called Amy Magus, it looks like a Queen Anne's lace. It can get a little out of hand in the garden. My last garden, I said I was never going to plant it. I planted it in this garden after one season. It's getting a little out of hand. But it has tons of blooms, a nice white, humble, flowered shape. Um, similar to that is Dacus. And it's it looks like a wild carrot flower, but it comes in muted tones of pinks and purples. And it has sort of that antique colors to it and it adds a really nice airiness. And it's definitely not weedy. It'll reseed a bit, but oh my gosh, that's my absolute favorite flower right now. Allium, which yes, are onions. You could let your onions go to a flower and you'll get these white big heads. But of course, the giant alliums that you plant in bulbs in the fall various different sizes of them that definitely add a lot of dramaticness to your bouquets. Snapdragons, of course, and once again, not just the little ones that you buy at nurseries, but make sure you buy the taller varieties. And of course, there's double snapdragons. Dahlias, um, the dinner plate dahlias, yeah, they they could overpower a bouquet. So some of the more pom-pom ones, the smaller ones, they do make great cut flowers. But if you want to just, you know, an amazing just dramatic bouquet you could just cut your dinner plate ones straw flower is an amazing flower you could dry that it lasts forever comes in multiple flowers blooms all summer long one of my favorites bachelor's buttons it's an earlier season um, i have a pink variety it's still blooming right now though there's blues lavender of course you know my favorite grosso provence um Yes, can't really beat lavender. Hang it upside down, dry it. Roses, of course. Uh, Kiss Me Over the Garden Gate. It um, is a tall plant and it has these dangly pink flowers. Um, It's uh, a polygonum, but it's called Kiss Me Over the Garden Gate. And then, of course, amaranth. And amaranth, you know, could hang down and be droopy. 
and adds a little bit of a little accent. It comes in anywhere from green to sort of like a beige to red. And Lysianthus this is the first year I've grown Lysianthus because for years I heard, oh, you can't grow it in the heat, can't grow it in the heat. And then I, I was, I think it was the 1818 Farms lady I did a um, conversation with. And then another farm around here, flower farm was growing it. I'm like, well, wait, wait a minute. Of course I could grow Lysianthus. So finally I got around to growing it. And what's great about Lysianthus is it looks like a rose, but it's, and it looks fragile, but it's a great cut flower. And the variety I was growing was white with a little bit of pink. Um, around the edges, but they come in all different colors and it's really a romantic flower. And then Celosia. Celosia, you probably heard it coxcomb where you have that really strange crested flower. There's that, but there's also the ones that have the plumes. Um, so those are my favorite cut flowers. These are all very easy to grow, full sun for the most part. And some of them will reseed. Like I said, there's so many more out there. Don't forget about foliage either. Like the, um, what am I trying to think about? Asparagus. Asparagus foliage works great as a really airy foliage. Asparagus, like the vegetables? Yeah, the foliage right now. That's Hmm. really nice to add. So, and of course, you know, hydrangeas, they don't do great in bouquets. They're very short. You could use hydrangeas in bouquets, but they tend to wilt, but they, they dry really well too. So think about things that you could dry. So there's more out there, but those are my, those are my favorites. So, yeah. You know, the probably least thing in gardening that you talk about on the uh, flower power garden hour? Yeah. Flowers. Because people love vegetables. Yeah, I know. People love vegetables. They do. I know. I love flowers. I mean. I don't have a witty name for a vegetable show. No. Not really. No. Yeah, you could, you came up with flower, flower power garden hour. So it was funny because um, I keep he seeing flower power. It's not like, you know, we came up with the term flower power. That's like. No, but um, you like hate hippies. I do not hate hippies. I hate wannabe hippies. Okay. Yeah. You know, people who like spend more time on their outfits trying to look like they didn't spend time on their outfits than me who I'm like, just wear what you wore yesterday and the day before just shorts and a dirty t-shirt. When people are like, you know, yeah. like I'm like, I haven't brushed my hair in three days. I don't need to. I think you're confusing hippie with dirty. That's what I think. Like these people who like when you know, like their their outfits make it look like they're like, oh, I didn't really care about this. I'm like, yeah, you did. You put that outfit together. You like hippie music. What is hippie music? Uh, what was the one about the um? Uh, I mean, some like ship that sank. That's not hippie music. A the bit, um, a bit. the uh, Gordon Lightfoot. Yeah, yeah. What's that song? Uh, Wreck of Edmund Fitzgerald. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's not hippie at all. Mm, a little bit. Those guys were like on a ship, a, like carrying steel. Carrying steel. Yeah, they were loaded down with iron ore. Uh, iron ore. Hmm. Yeah, weighed more than, right? You're asking me to like the lyrics. Well, yeah, forget the lyrics. Yeah, that's not hippie at all. It's blue collar all the way. No, no. Gordon Lightfoot wasn't really hippie. He was more of like a sure singer that? songwriter, beatnik type. I don't know. He mm-hmm. just passed. Yeah, I know. Yeah, which yeah. is a bummer because uh, he was amazing. Anyways, um, sorry, I'm going off tangent, but still, Gordon Lightfoot didn't need didn't need a shout out. Um, all right. So if you like this podcast, rate and review on Spotify, you could give it a five star on Apple. You could give it a five star and write something nice. Tell me the name of your kitty cat even, or your dog. That's fine. Um, I'm, uh, I'm hold, a- on, hold on. Hold on. And then follow me on Instagram, Marlene, the plant lady, Facebook, Marlene, the plant lady, uh, share this, tell a friend. What were you going to say? Uh, his nickname was the hippie historian. Well, look at that. Gordon Lightfoot was a hippie historian. Yeah. With a name like Gordon Lightfoot, he needed a and nickname. He had hippie Volkswagen vans. Okay. He was right. a hippie. He was a hippie. But I still don't think the wreck of the Edmund Fitzgerald was a hippie song. They're carrying iron ore. He was a goddamn Canadian. Yeah, you didn't know that? No. Why would I know that? Now you don't like him? <laughs> well, he's got two strikes. He was a hippie Canadian. Ah. <laughs> uh. All right. Until next time, everyone. Happy gardening.